Hello, my name is Chantal. This is a presentation about quaternion quantum mechanics. This is actually a um, presentation based on Marek Danielewski's talk. He recently gave a seminar on his most recent paper called Foundations of the Quaternion Quantum Mechanics. It's a paper published in Entropy in 2020. And um, I think it was really an important presentation. And I thought I would like to try to record it so in order to make it more accessible to other people. Before I can actually get into the details of this presentation, I want to first give some introduction on the topic and also some motivation why we would even talk about this at all. And my goal is to make this sort of difficult topic really understandable. So it, I will go slowly and I'll explain everything in detail. And feel free to skip, obviously, if it's too easy for you. So first, I'll give the overview um, interpretation of quantum mechanics and about phonons. Then I'll talk about the Hagen-Kleinert Planck crystal, which was developed by both um, Hagen-Kleinert and Marek Danielewski. We'll talk a little bit about the motivation, what this could mean. Then I'll briefly introduce you to quaternions because that's not something many people use every day. Because the whole idea here is that we'll build up quantum mechanics using quaternions and we'll see why. And after that, we'll get into Marek's presentation. So many slides are taken from Marek with his permission and I highlighted whenever I remembered on each page which uh, slides were taken from Marek's presentation. And of course, there will be a lot of um, links in the description and also at the end of the talk. So you all know there are many interpretations of quantum mechanics, right? Starting from the Copenhagen interpretation, which is basically um, developed by Bohr and Heisenberg, which is sort of mainstream right now. The idea here is that the wave function is not real and that there's this wave function collapse upon a measurement, which is immediate. Then there's the De Broglie Bohm um, interpretation, which is also referred to as a pilot wave theory. Here, the wave function is actually real. It's more, it's like a guiding, it's guiding the equations. It's not local, um, it's deterministic, but there's still this notion of particle involved. So it's only this pilot wave that guides the particle. Then there's a statistical interpretation, which is really a minimalist ensemble interpretation. The wave function is really more like an abstract quantity. There are few assumptions, probably the fewest of all. Then I'm sure you all know the many worlds interpretation Everett. The idea here is that, you know, there's no wave function collapse. Instead, the universe splits into different universe, parallel universes each time a measurement happens. Of course, one challenge here is that, you know, it kind of violates physical laws, right? But still, it, you know, it's valid interpretation. Then there's super determinism. And there are many more interpretations. I only listed a few, so I'm sorry if your favorite one is not here. But there's also, I would, I've seen this word called um, neoclassical, which is really a realist interpretation, saying that there's something, some reality underneath, similar to the De Broly Bohm interpretation, except there in this model here, there are only waves. So why would we even talk about this, right? Well, clearly, uh, you can see there are many possibilities. So given that there are so many possibilities, people have, there's no agreement. So it is still valid to talk about this. And um, in fact, um, Murray Gelman, he had, um, he got a Nobel Prize in about um, development of uh, particle physics. He said, Niels Bohr brainwashed a whole generation of theorists into thinking that the job of finding an interpretation of quantum mechanics was done 50 years ago, which is clearly not true as you, as you can see, right? Um, and also Schrodinger, Schrodinger himself in 1952 in Dublin, he said, uh, let me say at the outset that in this discourse, I am opposing not a few special statements of quantum physics held today. I'm opposing as it were the whole of it. I'm opposing its basic views that have been shaped 25 years ago when Max Born put forward his probability interpretation, 
which was accepted by almost everybody. So he was actually really upset because he believed there is a real wave, not just the probability. So this is the idea that this is all just a probability is, is an interpretation. Now, what would be a classical view? What would this wave be? What? How could we imagine this being a real wave? So let's first look at something actually classical. I mean, classical, I mean an actual phenomenon we can see in crystals. And this is something called phonons. You may have heard of it. Um, sometimes it's referred to as particle of sound or particle of heat. It's something that's used in condensed matter physics. And this, again, this is totally classical. So we are talking about a real, real crystal that vibrates, okay? And these vibrational modes, as you know, this, this crystal vibrates, it, you will see sometimes these quantized motions, these quantized, it, they refer to this as quasi particles. So it, these, these uh, vibrational modes, they behave similar to particles. Right? They move around, they behave like bosons. Um, they're basically quantized sound waves. The difference here is that here we know it is just a wave because obviously we know sound is, is a wave. So, and this is in a, in a solid, right? So there's no question about even that this is a particle. We all know this is just a vibration, but it, it kind of looks like a particle. And so it's also called a a quasi particle we and actually it has a lot of properties to photons so you know both photon and phonon are bosons you know photon is referred to as a particle of light photon is a particle of sound both are quantized energies both have this wave particle duality both actually their energy is h times f and of course, there's differences too, right? But photons are electromagnetic waves, phonons are excitations of a group of atoms. But then makes you kind of wonder, right? I mean, if a phonon, which is clearly a wave, it has no particles, there, there's no particle associated with this, why shouldn't this be possible for photons as well, right? So the reasoning that, oh, we need a particle is maybe not true, who knows? And interesting, you can even do a double slit experiment with phonons. We all know how it works with photons, right? This picture on the right is a um, experiment using polariton, surface polaritons. There is a movie somewhere, but I couldn't find it anymore. So you can actually uh, see the wave pattern generated by this Young's double slit experiment. And interestingly, right? While for photons, people always say, oh, this is kind of weird, you know, because when you measure it, suddenly it's in one place. Well, for phonons, there's no, it's the same thing. It's the same math. It's the same experiment. But clearly, it's just a wave, right? There's nothing weird about it. It's just a wave. And so um, I, it makes me wonder why should it be so different for photons, right? If the math is the same as for phonons. So, and there's actually a paper, oh, there are several paper on phonons. One of them is mentioned here, uh, and it says, the quantum mechanical properties of phonons in a one-dimensional lattice are studied with the conclusion that the phonon behaves in all essential respects as a normal quantum particle. Wave function collapse of the phonon state is shown to occur in an automatic way when an observation is made. This gives possible insight concerning the nature of wave function collapse in the general particle case. So when you think about this, with phonons, we know these are just vibrations and the measurement basically transforms this wave into another state. It's a dynamic process that takes time. So, you know, couldn't it be the same for photons? It's just a question, right? So to me, that's one of the motivations to look further into this topic, to see if that's possible or not. Let's briefly talk about Minkowski space time. Minkowski space time. Um, you all know that you know this is composed of three spatial and one time dimension, and gravity is caused by space time curvature. So if we picture this sort of 
it's kind of hard to picture because it's four dimensional, right? But there's this curvature, this abstract curvature in space time that causes gravity. Um, you probably didn't know, but there is an equivalent, mathematically equivalent model initially developed by Hagen Kleinert. Um, and basically what he did, he did a simple coordinate transformation. So instead of space time, we have space density. Everything else stays the same. And in this model, you can imagine um, a 3D coordinate system with changes in density, right? So wherever there is a lot of matter, the grid is a little bit condensed. So it curves the space and gravity in this model is actually refraction. It's an optical mechanical analog to general relativity. Now you think, oh, that's crazy, right? But the people in condensed matter physics, they use an optical mechanical analogy to general relativity. They use the metric tensor code to calculate things in condensed matter. And um, Marek Danielewski, he has also written about this and his work that I will present later in this talk is actually based on this Planck-Kleinert crystal. Okay, this is Hagen Kleinert and someone created a portrait of this crystal. Obviously, it would probably not look like this. <laughs> so this is now a slide taken from uh, Marek Danielewski's talk, a visualization of, of course, this is, an abs this is just a visualization, but it maybe gives you some intuition of what this could be. And let's play this. So basically, this is like, Imagine like a 3D you know, elastic solid, okay, with that can have deformations. So you can imagine it can have uh, transverse waves, transverse waves, longitudinal waves, you know, it can have uh, basically compression and, and torsion inside of it. But the crystal as a whole stays, it, it doesn't break, it stays in one piece, it doesn't change overall in volume. This is the whole idea of this Planck Kleiner crystal. Now you think, oh, this is far fetched, right? But, you know, refraction is, every, if you wear glasses, you know, you know what refraction is. And you can actually do an experiment in your kitchen. Um, and I got this from YouTube. Uh, I will put the link in the description as well. So, what you can do, you can create a gradient of water and sugar so a sugar gradient so you have lots of sugar at the bottom and less sugar on top and when you shine a laser through it because of the gradient so they should grade it from top to bottom okay um when you shine a laser through it the laser light will start to bend that's simply be caused by refraction because there's a gradient right which changes the speed of light actually there's also um, another analogy and that's optical black holes. There are multiple papers on this. This one is from Nature, originally based from Nature, but there was a um, there's a link also at the end of the presentation to this. Here is from the experiment, and on the right side is the theory. So what they did, they had a sort of a meta material, uh, a optical material which has an increased, also gradient. Um, an increasing refractive index and um, when they shine light towards it the light would bend because of the uh, refraction and because if it's a gradient at some point you know if the refractive index is large enough the light can no longer escape so it's very similar to a black hole except here it's an optical black hole i think that's very cool there are also um, black holes of sound so so maybe this is not all that mysterious and maybe this optical analog as gravity is maybe not so strange. So what kind of properties would this crystal have? Um, the length of this grid from one, one element to the next is called the Planck length, LP. It's in the order of 1.1 to the 10 to the minus 35 meters. So very, very small. The Planck mass is this, and there's also the um, Planck time. Here is the frequency, 
1.8 times 10 to the 43. So that's basically the fastest process that's possible. And this would be the smallest thing possible. And these values are actually from um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. So in summary, what is this planck clannard crystal? You can view it, you know, you have, I'm sure you have heard of the term fabric of space-time, right? When we talk about Minkowski space-time. So there is this notion that the vacuum is something like, well, it can bend, right? So like a, the, the grid. Now, in this case, it is the fabric of space-time, but it's space density. So you have three coordinates of, of space and one of density. Um, you know, it's, it's, you can more picture it like a, like a grid, like a 3D grid. It is an elastic solid, um, which can have compression and, and torsion. And the analog of gravity is an optical analog. And even though you may think this is all strange, even Maxwell talked about this. So he, he actually said in 1869, the assumption, therefore, that gravitation arises from the action of the surrounding medium leads to the conclusion that every part of this medium possesses, when undisturbed, an enormous intrinsic energy, and that the presence of dense bodies influences the medium so as to diminish this energy wherever there is a resultant attraction. I'm unable to understand in what way a medium can possess such properties. I cannot go any further in this direction in searching for the cause of gravitation. So he thought that there must be some kind of medium and that matter would influence it. So basically, when there's a lot of matter, like an earth or sun, that medium would be more dense, right? Which, which increases the refractive index, which causes um, gravity. And actually, even Einstein was not, uh, you know, had, had these thoughts. So this, as you can see, this is not just some crazy idea. Um, you know, famous, a lot of famous people had these thoughts. He um, said at the Reichs University in Leiden, he said, more careful reflection teaches us, however, that the special theory of relativity does not compel us to deny ether. We may assume the existence of an ether, only we must give up ascribing a definite state of motion to it. Recapitulating, we may say that according to the general theory of relativity, space is endowed with physical qualities. In this sense, therefore, there exists an ether. According to the general theory of relativity, space without ether is unthinkable. For in su such space, there not only would be no propagation of light, but also no possibility of existence for standards of space and time, measuring rods and clocks, nor therefore any space-time intervals in a physical sense. So even Einstein said there must be something like a fabric of space-time, right? So even though a lot of um, concepts of ether have been disproven, so we know there's, for instance, no gases, no gas or something, you know, there's no ether wind. There have been a lot of experiments, but, but there has, but a, real, a solid ether has not been disproven, for instance, an elastic solid is actually possible. Why a solid? Because, well, it must support transverse waves. It must support um, all different wave shapes, right? So that's actually still possible. So this is just to give some motivation. Why should we even think about this? And also maybe that's not so crazy. Now, before we can actually dive deeper, I'll have to, I want to give you a brief overview of quaternions because I mean, I, it was kind of new to me. So, and it took me a while to understand it. So I think it's not all of you might know about, about quaternions. So maybe you have heard about the gimbal lock. If you fly airplanes, or if you even if you play computer games, maybe you have heard of this. Um, basically, when you have a gyroscope, rotation is measured um, with three axes normally, right? They are orthogonal to each other. 
But what can happen though, when you fly, say a plane, or actually it happened uh, in Apollo 11, when you turn 90 degrees, like in this case, um, the airplane moves upwards so that the green axis is now aligned with the blue axis. This is called a gimbal lock because now these both axes are combined and you can no longer separate them. And so when you have a gyroscope, for instance, and you measure your, your um, orientation, you know, the system can no longer tell what orientation you have. And that's really, they even had a special button in the Apollo 11. That's what happened. They, they even have a special warning light for gimbal lock. And when this happened, they had to manually start to navigate because the system wouldn't work anymore. So this is just one example of the problems we have with dealing with rotations in space and why maybe a different system might be better than using the standard Euler angles. Now, if you have been working in computer graphics or if you are a game developer or you just play around in Unity, you will have heard about quaternions. So what are they? They are described with four numbers, one real and one scalar and three complex complex number. Now, don't get, get scared by the word complex because basically all it means that three of the numbers, so the last three, are used to determine the axis of orientation using x, y, and z, just like a vector. It you know, points in the direction of the rotation axis. And the first number is used to tell how much to rotate. So why would you use this? Well, imagine you have a camera in a computer game, right? You move your camera to another location. Now, when you move a camera, it's not just a, a translation, right? More, most of the time you want to also rotate the camera around an object, for instance. And this movement is calculated using quaternions. Quaternions are very, very well suited to compute smooth um, rotations. Because when you just use the Euler angles, you get this problem with the suddenly, you know, uh, you get flips in and you get weird behavior. And with quaternions, you don't. It's very easy with quaternions. Um, there are many ways to represent them. Uh, and th in this presentation, we use several of them. So sometimes you just list the four numbers. So again, the last three are the rotation axis in, in, in computer graphics. The first one is the amount of rotation. Sometimes you will see I, J, and K, where each one is a different axis, like the X, Y, and Z axis. Sometimes you will see a key with a hat on it, and sometimes you will see the vector, because the, 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 these last three are basically vectorial, and the first one is a scalar. And there are some really good um, YouTube videos, and also a, there's an interactive um, page where you can play with quaternions to really understand them. And... The link is here in the description, also on the last slide. So who actually invented them? It was Sir William Rowan Hamilton in 1843. The history goes that he was walking, well, he has been working um, with, uh, with 3D, 3D operations, um, but he, he's been using vectors and he got stuck with it for years because he just couldn't figure out how to properly get this to work. You know, he did, he thought maybe he will need, um, you know, instead of just the I, also a J, basically a second complex number, but it just didn't work. And he was walking across this bridge in 1843 with his wife and suddenly he had the idea, oh, we need a third one, we need a third complex number. Oh my God, he didn't think of it before. And he was so worried he might die of a heart attack right then. He carved this into the bridge. It's actually still, so they, yeah, in, in the bridge right there. And so one of the insights he had is that I squared, you know, for comp the complex sum of, you know, that I squared is minus one. And for quaternions is similar, except we have now, instead of one chord uh, axis of rotation, we have three. So J squared is minus one, minus one, K squared is minus one, and I times J times K is minus one. Now, that sounds weird, I know, but it's basically, if you think about this, it's just diff three different coordinates um, directions, of course. And there are many talks about this or presentations. I won't have time to go into the details. There are people who can do this much better than I can um, to, to, ex 
to understand what these are. Interestingly, um, vectors are not suited at all at all for working within 3D space. It sounds strange because we are all used to vectors, right? But in fact, the problem is with vectors, division is not defined. Did you ever learn division in school for vectors? No, because there's no division. Um, there are only four division algebras. Literally, it can be proven there are only four. So you can have division, you know, with real numbers, obviously, complex numbers, quaternions, and octonions. So, you know, for instance, in vect with vectors, you have the dot and the cross product. It's kind of clumsy, no division. And so actually quaternions make a lot of things easier in, in 3D space. And Maxwell, again, <laughs> he also, he noticed, oh my God, this is really cool. He said, the invention of the calculus of quaternions is a step towards the knowledge of quantities related to space, which can only be compared for its importance with the invention of triple coordinates by Descartes. The ideas of this calculus, as distinguished from its operations and symbols, are fitted to be the greatest use in all parts of science. He actually tried to reformulate electromagnetism um, with, with quaternions, but he unfortunately failed because it's not super trivial. Uh, and others failed too, unfortunately. So people, unfortunately, they kind of gave up on it for a long time and they just used vectors because it's, I guess it's easier. And so unfortunately, all of quantum mechanics has been built up with vectors and matrices instead of quaternions. So this is where Marek comes to the rescue. So of course, other people have tried this too, and there are other papers on this, uh, but he has now derived a lot of quantum mechanics based on quaternions. And I will start to try to explain now how, if I can. <laughs> So let's go back to the crystal, okay? What kind of things can happen to a crystal? Well, it's, we call it deformation fields. So you can have compression, that's just you know, denser, more denser, less dense compression, uh, to divergence, which is um, irrotational, or you can have curl or twist, which is basically the rotational, the twist part, right? And maybe you can all kind of see where this is going because um, we can split up a vector field into these two parts. In fact, that's, this is called a Helmholtz decomposition. And he has proven that any such field you can decompose into the um, irrotational part, divergence, and the rotational part. Now, based Purely based on this definition, it's clear that the rotation, the twist of um, the compression part obviously must be zero, right? And also uh, the opposite, the divergence of the rotational part must be zero because that's how we define it. We, we actually split it up into these two parts. And so if you look at these symbols, these will come up in many places in this presentation. So... Um, you will see uh, U0 as for the compression or sigma zero will be used for compression. And then you have the vectorial part, um, the U phi, or with the arrow, or um, with the U phi, yeah, will, will be denoted as the, the curl. So how do you actually work with deformations in, a, in an actual solid? Not, not just this hypothetical Planck crystal, but in a real solid. So you have a chunk of you know, crystal on your table or elastic solid. How do you work with this? And Gauchi has, been de he has developed the displacement mechanics, how you calculate things, um, how, you know, the deformations in, this, in, this crystal, in, in an elastic solid. Basically, you have translation and rotation. The point is the overall shape or size is the same. So your overall, you know, um, cube is the same in volume. The whole thing does not just get bigger or smaller. It stays the same. But internally, you can have compression and twists. Okay. Um, so if you can, if you imagine you have in your room 
a, a big coordinate system with with rubbers, rubber bands, for instance, in all the di three directions, right? And you you hold it with your hand in there and you do something with it. Basically, it means you're not going to break the coordinate system. The coordinate system stays. You can you can change it, translate it. You can rotate things around. You can combine all these movements, but you don't break it. And basically, he has developed a very simple formula of how how you know the equation of motion. And by motion, it means each individual grid element basically in there. So this is um, the acceleration is a combination of the gradient of the compression and the twist of the twist. Okay, it's actually quite simple. This is how it's spelled out. And again, this all these most of these slides are from Marek Danielewski's talk. Okay, these are not mine. These are from Marek's talk. <laughs> so this is how what you would do to to model the um, deformation of of an elastic so of a real elastic solid. And now the thing is that modeling such a thing, it's not vectors are really not suited as I mentioned before. Um, you know, you cannot reduce this problem to vectors. There's, there's no division operation. And so he, so basically after trying to work with this for a long time, that's when I mentioned that Hamilton invented the use of quaternions because it makes things a lot easier. The point is this, there's basically a deformation field sigma. So the whole thing is called sigma, the whole deformation field. Such that one can represent the solenoidal, the vector, so that's the rotational part, and the scalar field, which is the compression part, as a superposition of real and imaginary field parts at each point. It's just the same thing as the Helmholtz decomposition, right? It's really the same thing. All we're saying is we can build it up from compression and torsion. That's it. These are the symbols used, so you will see them again. It kind of helps to get familiar with these because otherwise it gets kind of confusing if you don't know them. So, um, so the sigma, this is the whole comp the whole deformation field is composed of the irrotational part, the scalar, and the vectorial part, the, the curl, right? And this is the a complex conjugate is basically a, a minus instead of a plus. And these these numbers, so this this is a basically a quaternion, right? Because you need you need four numbers to represent this. You need the scalar and three vector vector parts, right? So these are quaternions. And this is how um, sometimes this is written, right? Okay. So and again, this is really nothing that complicated. All it means, you know, we have the first scalar is compression. And the other three, the complex parts, so the i, phi 1, the j, phi 2, the k, phi 3, is, is the rotation, is the rotation, the twist in 3D space. That's all it is. Oh, I had the macro on. So now when you think about this, how, what kind of numbers do we have in um, quantum mechanics? Well, in quantum mechanics, we have something a little bit similar, although not exactly. We also have um, compression, and we have one imaginary number, right? If you know Schrodinger's equation, the i in there, which bothered me all the time because I never really saw a clear explanation of why it should be there. It's basically just one axis of rotation instead of three. So when you think about this, all it is really, it's a, you can project a quaternion with three uh, imaginary axis with three axes of rotation to one axis. It's the same thing, except here you only have the eye left in, in, in standard quantum mechanics. And with quaternions, you have three axes. That's it. But it, it, it's totally, I mean, it seems to me obvious that this is compatible because you can always convert a quaternion back to a complex number by just, you know, setting the other, by projecting the axis, the 3D axis down to a to a flat, to the 2D space, right? But we'll talk a lot more about this, so don't worry about this. So now all the trick, all the things you have to do now is uh, combining Gauchi and Helmholtz. And again, these slides are all from Marek Danielewski talks. These are not my slides. These I, I, I took his slides and I combined them with mine, but basically this is not my material, this is Marek's material, just to be clear. So he had the idea to combine 
Gauchi and Helmholtz. It's actually quite simple. So remember, this is the Gauchi equation of motion. And we know we can separate out the compression and torsion part. Now all we have to do is apply it, right? It's actually quite straightforward. So we do two steps. First, we apply the, the, the divergence. And afterwards, we'll do the same thing. We apply um, the, the, the curl, the rotation. So when we apply the divergence to this, because of the way this was defined, right? We, we def how we split it up, we know the divergence of the uh, vectorial part must be zero because that's the rotation. So divergence of the rotation must be zero. So this uh, turns to zero, and um, so that simplifies when when you when you um, this is turns to zero, and and now all we need to do now we make a little simplification. We just we replace. Um, divergence of the scalar part with sigma zero, okay? This is the equation you get. And this is actually a longitudinal wave in three dimensions. So by this simple applying Helmholtz and Gauchi, we end up with a longitudinal wave in 3D. That's nice, right? I mean, that was pretty simple. So now let's do the same thing, but apply uh, rotation on the, you're basically using the, the Helmholtz decomposition, we apply the rotation to Gauchi. And here, of course, we know that um, the scalar part, so the compression part in the Helmholtz decomposition has no rotation. So that must be zero, right? So when we apply this, we, we apply the rotation, all the red parts end up being zero. We just purely based from definition. So this simplifies quite a bit. It's still a bit long, but um, We'll go to the next page to see. Uh, and of course, please read the paper. The paper has a lot more detail and some of, you know, I, I don't want to go through all the detailed steps. It will take too long. But the principle is quite simple, right? Um, now, what we also know is we know that the rotation of the gradient of something is zero as well. And finally, we make a substitution. We replace all the rot u, the factorial part, um, with this symbol here, okay? So when you apply both, it gets already simpler. See, because all the red, see that old red part goes away, it's zero, okay? This one is replaced by, um, by phi. And this is the same as from the previous page. And now we do one final replacement. We change this, we simplify this with the Laplacian operator and what you end up with here. This is nothing else but a transverse wave, right? So that's pretty nice. So all we did is we applied the Helmholtz decomposition to Gauchi and we end up with longitudinal and uh, transverse waves. So both. Again, this is just a summary again of both. But of course, remember we split it apart. In fact, we have to look at the whole thing together, right? We are talking about this whole deformation field. Now, so it's a sum. We have to look at both together. That, so it's not just either transverse wave or longitudinal, it's actually a combination of both, right? It's a combination of these waves, which means we can generate all kinds of shapes of, 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 a, of waves. Any combination of transverse and longitudinal, you will, you will get all, all kinds of shapes imaginable, right? For instance, here's one example, it's just one example. You, there's a mathematical trick you can do. So um, remember, this is the original equation we just started with, which is the combination of the transverse and the longitudinal. And we can, we can always add something and then subtract it at the same time, right? It's still the same equation. And we do, when we do this trick, we end up with the Klein-Gordon equation, which is a rel relativistic wave equation, and it's Lorentz invariant. So what kind of physical constants could we actually calculate from this model? Can we actually calculate something from this? Well, we have the formula now, right? And um, what we can now do, since we have the equations, we can now put in the values and see what comes out. And when we do this substitution here, and again, details are in the paper. So LP, LP is the uh, Planck length for instance, 
then we this can be expressed as a function of the local mass density and you can already see the g in here okay now when we do this based on the work by Marek Danilevsky what we can do we can calculate g the gravitational constant and it turns out to be 6.67408 something 10 to the minus 11 and the official number I think it's from 2006 is 6.674 something 10 times 10 to the minus 10. so it's very close and I think that's really amazing right we have just you know start with a simple model uh, of this crystal use you know Gauchy's equation of motion in Helmholtz decomposition and now we end up with these constants which match actually what's been measured so I think this has to be taken seriously right this is pretty amazing I mean to me that's very amazing so and actually Marek Danielewski has calculated many more constants using this model this is just there are several papers you should really check out his uh, research page he has a, altogether about 190 papers and several are on, on this um, elastic solids and, and it, you know, in condensed matter physics, but also on this Planck planet crystal. For instance, um, he has also calculated um, the Planck constant. So he comes up, he comes up with 6.626, 10 to the minus 34, and the official NIST number value is 6.626. It's almost the same. Can you see that? How accurate it is? This is just amazing. I mean, how, when, if you have a model that makes such predictions, I think that's pretty, that's really convincing to me. He also calculated the speed of light using um, the constants, right? Using the young modulus and all these. Um, and he comes up again to a value that's very close to the, to the official value. So, well, we, we're not stopping here. So we just started, right? We, we, have, we have derived uh, some wave equations, but we want to get to Schrodinger, right? Now, this gets a little bit complicated, and I'm not going to go into extremely detail, extreme details. So please read the paper. The, in, the, in the paper there, it's much more, uh, there are many more steps. And there's also in the appendix, there's a lot more explanation there about two or th two pages or so of math and I, I don't want to go through this whole thing it's easier if you just read it I will show you just a few things okay because I want to more co you know convey the concepts and ideas than the actual little detailed steps so to derive the Schrodinger equation we'll have to think about what it means to have um, the gradient of a quaternion we need to define that obviously right what's the derivative what's the gradient of the quaternion and so this is called the Gauchy Riemann operator. It's represented by a D. It acts on quaternion valid functions, so functions with quaternions. So D applied to this is this, the gradient, obviously. Is, it's very simple, actually. I mean, the first part, remember, is compression. The second one is the rotational part. So it's just the gradient of the compression of the, the scalar part and the, the, the curl of the of the vectorial part and that's the quaternion that's all it is the definition of quaternion so when you apply this twice you get the laplacian operator and so d corresponds physically to the gradient uh in 3d space it's not that bad not that complicated so to get to schrodinger we have to talk about energy how do we define the energy of a displacement field right yeah imagine you have this crystal and uh, you know as it vibrates you have this motion motion of the grid elements or little particles that, that vibrate so there's energy in there in a the movement of, of this grid so to define the energy per mass unit in the deformation field it's a composition of the the so this is the um the velocity of the of the of the elements in, in the grid of the deformation field and um, then we have also and of course to calculate the energy of a volume we have to do the integration right so the, the top one this one is the energy per mass unit and this one is the integration over a certain volume 
And of course, we could we could also have a um, external field that work that is applied to that deformation field. So how do we get to Schrodinger from this? And of course, again, I mentioned there are several steps, and I won't go through all the details. There are a few tricks. Um, basically, the rescaled velocity, so the, the, the velocity divided by um, c, this the normalized velocity, is related to the normalized gradient of the mechanical potential. So LP is the Planck length. When you do, when you know, so you have to keep this in mind, and then we start to we do some substitutions. We, um, re we define phi as this expression here, and what's happening from here to here, basically, instead of um, sigma and so on, we replace we we put this expression in here. Don't, you know, please again in the paper, it's much more detailed. Then also what we do, we substitute, so we divide by C, and of course if we divide by C, we have to put it here. Um, then we replace this, this normalized um, velocity with the, this expression here with the mechanical, um, what was it called? The normalized gradient of mechanical potential to get this expression. And um, this has to be minimized and there's something called the Dubois Raymond lemma which I'm not familiar with in detail. So but when you do this and when you read in the paper the step by steps, then you end up with this and you can already kind of see the resembles um, of the Schrodinger equation. And all you have to do now is re basically replace some of these constants and then you end up with the time invariant Schrodinger equation. Okay? All based on quaternions now. And so what does it mean? Instead of the i that we normally have, right? So the traditional Schrodinger equation has the complex i in there. Instead of that, we have i, j, and k. And now it's kind of clear what this is, right? This is just the rotation axis. It has to do with the rotation. That three makes a lot more sense to me than just i. I always, this has always bothered me. And so this, to me, makes a lot more sense. Um, so also the psi, of course, is not just complex, it's a quaternion, right? So, so now again, let's go back to this picture. Maybe you can see that this is really not so much different from the basically original quantum mechanics, except instead of one complex number, I, we have three now using the quaternions. So I think, and again, when you project the quaternion onto a plane, basically, you, you're are left with the i. So it's not that much different. And to me, the quaternion makes a lot more sense because it's much more general. It's much more general. And I'm looking forward to future work because what's next, of course, is, well, how do you represent spin? What about the Dirac equation? And if you know about this, you know, the spy spinners and the Pauli matrices, um, clearly they have to do something with, with rotation. So it's kind of obvious that it should be much more elegant to to formulate these things with quaternions than suddenly having these matrices inside your equation, right? Makes no sense to me. So, yeah, so this is a question for me. I mean, this is just the beginning. He, you know, this is a paper that was just published, but that's not the end of it. This is the beginning. So I would encourage any of you, if you have any suggestions, what else, in what direction the research would go, just write in the comments and, um, you know, uh, send me an email if you like, <laughs> because uh, or or do research on your own. This is this is an exciting new opportunity to develop these things, these techniques, and you know, you know, what about visual visualizing all this? What does spin look like? And this is another from a YouTube video, a, a nice video that it's obviously not exactly like in in the crystal, but it would be similar because as you can see, if you look at the this is called the belt trick in a way, this rotation here. You know, it keeps rotating. You see how the cube keeps rota rotating without breaking the coordinate system, right? It doesn't break. So you, we could imagine we could visualize this in the crystal as well. It doesn't actually break the, the coordinate system. So I imagine spin would look, could look similar. I don't know. This is just by my hypothesis. So now back to the interpretations of quantum mechanics. Remember I had this little box here that said neoclassical. So basically... In this model, the wave function is real. It's ontological. 
but then there are no true particles. So everything we, you know, electrons, protons, neutrons, photons, everything exists in our world is just waves. It's just different wave shapes, different wave forms. And anything that to us looks like a particle is just like a phonon, like it, it's basically a quasi particle. Of course, to, to us, it looks like a particle because it's, you know, it's quantized, but um, there are no true particles in that sense. And of course, obvious question that he might have had right from the start is, well, you know, oh, this this sounds like there's an absolute frame of reverence, reference, horrors, right? How could, well, this is clearly not compatible to special relativity. If there's, an, you know, we all know there's no absolute frame of reference. Well, if you think about it, let's just think about this for a minute, okay? So the question is, is this Lorentz invariant? Can't you just tell we're, you know, there's an absolute frame of reference? Can we just determine our speed if if there is this crystal, can we just measure how, how fast we are going along, uh, you know, the crystal and also the speed of light? Well, it would be constant in an absolute sense, meaning it's constant in the crystal. So wouldn't a moving observer see a different speed of light slower? Well, actually, no, because remember, we are all composed of waves, which means our clocks are composed of waves. Okay. Here is an example. The, the, a very simple clock. Imagine it's a circular standing wave, let's say transverse wave, okay, that goes in a circle. And each time it goes around in a circle, it's one click. So it goes tick, tick, tick. Right? Let's imagine you have two clocks, a stationary one and a moving one. On the right, this one is moving downwards. And remember, the speed of light is constant in the crystal, okay? So when the clock moves downwards, you get a helical path. It's no longer circular. It means it's a longer path. Okay. So in the same amount of time, they travel the same distance because the speed of light is constant. But so when the first clock is doing a whole revolution, the second moving clock maybe only gets to here because it has to go a longer path. Right. What does that mean? It means the second clock is ticking more slowly than the first one. And it's not a conspiracy. You can do this on a piece of paper. It's very simple. Uh, actually, and if if you like, I'm going to go one step further. I have a simple analogy, which really my goal was to explain this to my dad. So I wanted to make a simple explanation of special relativity. So obviously this is not a model you can take one to one. But let me, it's, it's, it's so simple that I think you will, if you understand this, you will totally understand special relativity. Okay. Something you can do actually on a boat. So imagine you have a boat and um, you have this water clock, this wave clock, which all it does is you have, um, you know, a stick you or something you point in the water, which generates this wave. And when the wave reaches the bell, it, it rings. That's one tick of the clock. Okay. So there's, you can, you can see the wave front, how it, how it spreads. And, and after, after some time it, it hits the bell and it rings the bell. Very simple, right? So that's our clock. Of course, the model breaks down at some point because you have to look at the water speed and the wave speed and the size of the wave. But this is, this is detailed. It's just a big concept. So now let's compare a stationary boat where the wave basically travels, um, to the clock, to the bell like this, to a moving boat. Now, when you have a moving boat, when we, you know, start the clock, the tick here, but then the move boat moves to the right. What happens is the path is getting longer until the wave fronts reach the bell. So, and because the speed of the wave, just like the speed of light is constant, assuming there's, it's not a river or anything. Um, so this moving clock will tick more slowly than the stationary clock. That's all there is to it, special. but this is really old. It's really not that, not that difficult. So now we can just draw this and all you need to know is Pyth Pythagorean um, thing. Um, so basically you have the, the moving boat. So the boat is moving at a velocity V and all, all there is is a triangle and you get the Lorentz uh, factor out of this very easily. You can do this on a piece of paper in like five minutes. No, two minutes actually. <laughs> so. 
Now, of course, the difference is in the in the crystal world, we are also composed of waves, right? And of course, in this model, um, the boat was not a wave; it was actually a material. Uh, yeah. So, so, but so we have to we have to use actually the a, a crystal world to to this properly. Imagine there was a a phonon world, so a crystal with phonon people, everything composed of waves. It's the same thing, right? So we have phonon clock where um, this sort of boat composed of waves as well emits a signal and then it gets measured on the other side, right? So uh, basically, like a, a you know, solid and wave. And now it's the, sa it's the same thing, you know, because if the speed of light is constant in this absolute crystal or grid, then the moving clock, right, the path is longer to reach that target here to, to uh, cause a click. It's got to be slower. It cannot kick us, click as fast because the path is long. It, it's very obvious. I mean, when you think about this, it's very super, super obvious. And again, it's just a, a triangle, the Pythagorean, I can't say the Pythagoras. <laughs> um, it's very easy calculation. So special relativity is just an emergent phenomenon. All wave systems have special relativity. It's, it's nothing special, really. Here's the calculation. It's really, really simple. So here's the links. I will also put them um, down in the description. And if you have any other any questions, I like to explain things in simple terms. So if you ever wondered about anything in physics, let me know. Maybe I'll I'll do a video on this. Thank you for listening and your patience. <laughs>